Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, how we love to praise you. Father, you are a gracious and merciful God. And Lord, as we come before you in awe of who you are, as we've lifted up our voices praising to you, because Lord, we know truly who you are and the grace that you've poured out upon us through Jesus Christ, that we as a people can stand here forgiven and righteous before you, not through our own works, our own efforts, Lord, but through your accomplished work of Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that you would speak to us today. Pierce into our hearts with your words. Let our eyes see you. Let our minds think about you. And let our lives be filled with you. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, <clears throat> if I could tell you that I could guarantee that in three to five years, your life would be better, that I could guarantee that the secret that I'm going to tell you will change everything about how you engage in life and ultimately how you view things. It doesn't matter. The circumstances of your life aren't going to matter. But I can guarantee you in three to five years, you'll have more purpose, you'll have more thankfulness, you'll have more gratitude, and life will just be better in general. How many people would take me up on it? Just a couple of you, because the rest of you are like, I don't care. I want the coffee in the back. When's that espresso machine coming in? That's I, no, but, but that's, that's one of the things that we, we often look at. How can could, how could life be better? What's interesting is back in, in 1960, there was a gentleman named Aaron Beck. And Aaron Beck was a, a psychotherapist at the time. Um, he may have been psycho and a therapist. I don't know about that, but he was a therapist at the time. And at that time, the primary means to, to therapy was psychoanalysis and stuff. And so it, it, psychology was a fledgling field. It was just kind of starting out. It had been going on for quite a few years, but there was a lot of research going on. And Aaron Beck coined what, what's commonly known today as cognitive therapy. And cognitive therapy, if you go to a therapist, there's a good chance you're, if you're an adult, you're going to engage in cognitive therapy uh, because cognitive therapy is very well established. It's well validated. It's well researched. It's effective. And the gist of what cognitive therapy is, I'm going to give you the Psych 101 version of this. The gist of cognitive therapy is this. Events happen in the world. We perceive those events and immediately we think of something. You may not catch the thought. It's what we call an automatic thought. The automatic thought it gets interpolated in, in your brain, and you react in a certain way. And so those automatic thoughts are sometimes set at childhood. If you had an abusive parent, sometimes that will create a situation where you have automatic thoughts. Something appears like a threat, and you may react. Okay, that's an automatic thought, and you have a reaction to it. But the automatic thinking is that's the, what you think about things ultimately impacts how you perceive or ultimately impacts how you re respond to those things. And so in cognitive therapy, what you try to find is what are the automatic thoughts? What's going on at the automatic? How do we control the thinking? So if you've ever been to a therapist, one of the, the tools that they'll use is that. Now, out of cognitive therapy came dialectical behavior therapy, um, cognitive behavioral therapy. All of these different branches of therapy come out of that. But it started in 1960. That's not that long ago. Some of you, like Bill Rood, were in high school in 1960. Actually, I think he might have graduated and been in the Marine Corps or the Air Force at that time. Some of you remember, I don't remember 1960. I wasn't born yet. I'm not 60 years old and old like that. That's, that's for one individual in the room in particular. Um, but but, but in 19, that's not that long. Let's be honest. That's not that long ago. And so we look at this. Man, it took a long time. Now, imagine my surprise when I went to graduate school to study psychology. And in the, if you're not familiar with some of my history, I got saved right at the very beginning of graduate school. And unlike some people, but like many others, I started, I got saved, and I decided, you know what? I need to read the Bible. What's in it? And so I start reading the Bible. And imagine my surprise when I come to the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus says, if you look at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery. And then he goes on and says, if you hate your brother in your heart, you've already killed him. And I remember looking at that thing, and hey, that looks a lot like cognitive behavior or cognitive therapy. He's talking about how we think about things that impacts our behavior. And so as I read a little further into the Bible, I got to Paul's writings, Paul's letters to the churches. And I looked at that and said, Dad Gummit, Paul talked about cognitive therapy all that time ago. It took the secular world 2,000 years to catch up. 
It was right there in the, in the Christian's hands the whole time. And we come today to a section that I'm going to tell you, if you apply this, it will change your entire life. In three to five years, everything will be different. Now, I could tell you that just about every week. I could say that if you apply what we're going to talk about. Today, I really mean it. No, I mean it every week. But today, I'm saying, listen, this is going to change your life. So grab your Bibles. We're going to turn to Colossians chapter 3. And Paul is going to teach us about cognitive therapy in the life of a Christian. Beginning in verse, verse 1, we're going to work through 17 verses today. We're going to start off in verse 1 of chapter 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek or in Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as, Christ, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience." Bearing with one another, and if, if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. Above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with a thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. What, a, what an interesting section of Scripture. And there's so much life packed up in that. Um, but, but Paul starts off with, with this, this, this really almost this seemingly interesting piece that I look at and think, man, he really talks about where's our focus? Where do we focus on things? And, and so when we look at that, sometimes it's helpful to kind of picture what that looks like. So I, have a, I, have a, I, I know that this is an Ohio quarter because in the last sermon, the first service, I forgot to look and I couldn't see it. So I know it's an Ohio quarter. And you guys may be familiar with, I don't know when they came out with the new state quarters, but they came out with those and they started kicking these things out and every state has its own quarter. Well, this is an Ohio quarter. If I held this quarter up and I had you come up and take a look at it and I was holding the back of it to you, I'd say, and I said, can you describe to me the Ohio, this quarter? And you would look at the back and you would say, well, it has a picture of Ohio and there's a guy on it. There's something there. Oh, it's an astronaut. And there's an astronaut, it says Ohio, and it has all this stuff. And you could, you could describe it in pretty good detail. And then if I said, tell me what the other side looks like. You might say, well, it probably has George Washington. And then you'd ask your, your spouse, is it George Washington or Abraham Lincoln? And they'd say, George, oh, it's George Washington probably. And, and, and I said, well, what's the date? Well, I don't know. Well, why don't you know? Because I'm not looking at it. You see, you can only describe what you're focused on. If I flip it over, now you can describe the other side. You can talk about George Washington's ponytail. You can talk about the date that the quarter was made and what it says on it. You can look at that because now you're focused on that. You see, life is very similar to this. When we walk through life, there are things that we focus on. And what Paul tells us at the opening of this section is to focus our minds on Christ to focus upon Him, to focus upon God, and, and ultimately everything else that He's going to say in this section comes out of that portion. Where are we focused? Are we focused on Christ? Because if we're focused on Christ, then a lot of these other things that are going to start to manifest or the challenges that we face become less challenging. But how are we doing on this? How do we do with these things? What is our focus really on? You know, I could look at your Facebook feed and tell you. I could look at your bank account and tell you. That's not my job anymore. Cyril's going to look at your bank accounts. 
Is the admin past? No, but that's, we, we can tell where things are but based on where is your focus. Are you worried about the politics of the, the United States? Are you worried about them coming and taking your guns? Are you worried about all these various other things that we fill our minds with and flood our, are, are we worried about those things? Or do we focus on Christ? Here's my guarantee. If you focus on Christ, you will rightly prioritize the other anxieties in your life. If you focus upon Christ, these other things that, that oftentimes take a preeminent stance in our lives will all of a sudden become less impactful. This is how Paul can write this from prison. Paul, so you, may not, you may have forgotten that. Paul spends most of his time, most of the New Testament is written by a guy who's in prison. And he's in prison because he goes and tells people about Jesus. How can he write about these things? Because his focus is upon exactly what he's telling us. And then he goes on from there, and he starts off this, this section after he tells us to focus our minds on Christ. He goes on and he, he begins to describe all these things we should die to. And, and it, it's interesting to look at this list, because he's got 11 different things listed here. And it goes like this, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. All of those kind of have to do with sexual stuff, right? Sexual morality. It's hard to deny that one has to do with sexual stuff, right? But a lot of these have to do with it. And then he goes on, and he talks about the wrath of God, and then he speaks of this, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. These are the things that it's interesting. But Paul mentions something that we often will pass by, the wrath of God. We don't like, we just sang about the love of God. We, I love talking about the love of God. I, that's my favorite thing to talk about because I need God's love and his grace in my life about every 10 seconds because I screw up somehow about that often. There goes another one. But we, we, we miss the wrath of God. It's interesting to think and consider about the, with the wrath of God. A.W. Pink in his book, The Attributes of God, identifies that the wrath of God is spoken of more in the Bible than God's love. What an interesting thing. Yeah, we don't talk about that much, do we? And Paul just mentions it here and says, that based on these sins, this is what the wrath of God's coming in for. This is, this is why it's being poured out. What an interesting thing. As I thought about the wrath of God, I thought, how do we, how do we miss this? Why, why is it not proclaimed? You know, this is where the fire, hellfire and brimstone preachers used to come in. Y'all go to hell! Right? And some of you y'all old-timers love it. Pound that pulpit, preacher! And that's, we don't hear that anymore because we want to hear about the love of God. I can liken it to this. Now, all of us saw that. Well, let me rephrase that. I got to be careful because some of y'all didn't heed the warning signs and are still on the path to hell. I'll tell you today, accept Jesus and you get off that path. But think of it like this. You're driving through Delaware because there's not much in Delaware to do. So you're just driving through because what do you do in Delaware? Get out of Delaware. So you're driving through Delaware. And on one side, here's a sign, warning, bridge out five miles ahead. And you look at the sign and say, oh my gosh, there's a bridge out. But then right after that, there's a sign, Delaware loves you. Oh, that's so nice. I'll just pay, Delaware loves me. Another sign, bridge out. Another one, bridge out. Delaware loves you. That's so nice. Delaware's so nice in Delaware. They love us. Bridge out two miles ahead. Bridge out one mile ahead. Delaware loves you. Bridge out quarter mile ahead. Delaware still loves you. Boom, you crash into the bridge. Now you're dead. But you're dying thinking, Delaware loves me, right? You never heeded the warnings. Why is the wrath of God mentioned so much? So that we will heed the warnings and recognize God's love. Sin separates us from God. Sin ultimately is the reason and the cause of God pour, God's wrath to be poured out. I'm going to read to you what I, I mentioned, A.W. Pink. I'm going to read to you what he says about this issue. The wrath of God is his eternal destination, or detestation of all unrighteousness. It is the displeasure and indignation of divine equity against evil. It is the holiness of God stirred into activity against sin. It is the moving cause of that just sentence which he passes upon evildoers. 
God is angry against sin because it is a rebelling against His authority, a wrong done to His inviolable sovereignty. Insurrectionists against God's government shall be made to know that God is the Lord. They shall be made to feel how great the maj that majesty is, which they despise, and how dreadful is that threatened wrath, which they so little regarded. Not that God's anger is malignant or malicious retaliation, inflicting injury for the sake of it, or in return for injury received. No, while God will vindicate His dominion as governor of the universe, He will not be vindictive. He speaks here of the recognition of there's, a, there's this interesting, and I should have gotten the verse. I can't remember where it is now. There's an interesting verse. I believe it's Paul that says it. That, that the, the, it alludes to the aroma that comes off of a Christian. And I can't, maybe you might remember where it is. I, I, but, but there's this aroma that we put off. If you're a Christian, and, and we love it, right? The aroma of Christ is a beautiful thing. I get around other Christians and we smell wonderful. But to those dying, it is a detestable stench. To those who want to re re repulse God and stay away from God, I don't want that near me. They want to reject him. They want to reject his authority. It's a stench. But to us, we love it. Why? Because we heeded the warnings. We accepted the love of Christ. To those dying in sin, what is left ahead is wrath. And that is a very scary thing. And Paul alludes to and recognizes and, and equates this and says, this is the, lists out these sins that are there and, and tells us, die to those. We, we've died to those things. Put them away. Don't do those things. And, and we look at that and think, well, that's great. That's awesome. Until he gets to whatever your sin is on the list, because it's there. And we look at that and think, ah, for instance, some of you drove here today. Somebody may have cut you off, that dirty, rotten scoundrel. And many of us will, will look at that and we fail to recognize how much time sin takes up in our lives, how much it consumes of us. But if you imagine the time when somebody cut you off or somebody did you wrong, and you go back and you're like, ah, they did me, whatever it was, they, they ripped you off in a deal, whatever it was. They did you wrong, you, you, it's, ah, man. If I could just go back and get them. They cut you off in traffic. You go home, you tell your spouse, you'll never believe what this dirty, rotten jerk did. And not only did they cut me off, they showed me their favorite finger while they did it. It was terrible. I'm like, oh, if I could just go back and kill them. Right? We go through this. Ah, ah. This happened four hours ago. Four hours. You go to bed at night, and you're still thinking, man, if I could just get them. I know what the car looks like. I'm going to find them tomorrow. I know what road I was on. I'm going to go and I'm going to cut them off. How much time that consumes? That's sin. That's what it does. It consumes us. Paul says, put it to death. How do we do that? How, how that let's, let's just be honest. How do we do that? We have this sin nature that's just screaming, right? We have this battle within us. How do we do that? Well, we look to Christ, and in Luke... We have an interesting account of what happens with Christ. You see, it's interesting as they called him or, or took him from the garden in, in this mock jury and they beat him and they flogged him. How did he respond? When they took him before Pilate and they made all these false accusations against him and all of that, how did he respond? When they tore his clothes and they beat him with a, a whip and they, they, they scarred and mutilated his body, and how did he respond? When they put the crown of thorns on him and mocked him, how did he respond? When they drove the nails into his hands and into his feet, how did he respond? You see, in Luke chapter 23, here's how he responded. When they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. Father, forgive them, 
for they know not what they do. Here Paul lists this whole list, this, these 11, these character traits, or these, these sinful traits that we have. He says, put them to death. How do we do that? How does Jesus on the cross look at them? Say, Father, forgive them. If we go back to Matthew's gospel, we see an interesting picture. In chapter 26, Matthew records this. And going a little farther, he fell on his face, speak, his face speaking of Christ in the garden. And prayed, saying, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Singularly focused on accomplishing the will of the Father. He endured the cross. How do we put away anger? How do we put away malice? How do we put away sexual immorality? How do we put these things away? Singular focus upon accomplishing the will of our Father. Accomplishing what Christ has put us here for. That's how we overcome this. We focus, our, focus in on what is the salvation I have. The salvation I have, I did nothing to earn. I, there's nothing, there was nothing I brought to the table. When Christ brought me in the fold, when, when I accepted Christ as my Savior, I was a drunk that smelled like booze. I, I was... Uh, 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 all types of debased. And I remember thinking, Jesus, you're getting a great deal here. Let me tell you all about me. No. I came to the table with nothing. And even in the midst of that, this broken, beaten, loser of a guy, God said, I love you. Put all that anger, put all the malice, put all that away. Come with me. If we focus upon him, oh, how easy it is. But then Paul does one more. He goes further. One of the things you'll learn in, in one of the things you do learn in, in life, if you've ever been on a diet, you know this. Don't go on a diet. <laughs> Let's put all that behind us now. If you ever have a habit that you want to get rid of, you know that whatever that habit is, it's there for a reason and a purpose. Right? That, that's why we develop habits. If you ever work with somebody who's got an addictive thing, there's a reason that it's there. It doesn't just happen. You know, it's, it's, people will feel like, hey, it just kind of happened. But if you've ever asked a drunk, why do you drink? And, and you start to look at the, the reasons why. Let me, let me just give you an example of how one of these conversations might go. A client comes to you and says, I, I fell off the wagon. I went back and started drinking again. Oh, well, what happened? Well, my wife came home. And she just was nagging me, and I couldn't handle it anymore. And so I went, and, and I said, you know, I'm done. And I went and got a drink. Well, what were you thinking? Well, I just couldn't handle the nagging anymore. What was she saying? Well, she was telling me that I needed to get up and get a job and do these things, and, and I just couldn't handle it. And, and so, so she was telling you that you needed to be responsible for these things, and you didn't want to do that. Yeah, but it was nagging. It was the way she was saying it. Well, how did you hear that? She was calling me. A loser. And in that, she's telling me she doesn't love me, and I'm alone, and I'll never amount to anything. So what did you drink for? To make it stop. You see, it's there for a reason. You've ever dealt with somebody with an addiction? That's a familiar story. The wife never said any of that, but what is the interpretation? Now you understand cognitive therapy. Now you understand the power of your thinking. You see, ultimately what we have to look at and what we, gotta, uh, we have to understand is in the midst of that, Paul's saying, put all this away. Well, we have to understand in the human condition, these are there, these are my, these are my precious, right? We've all seen Lord of the Rings. Little golems running around, my precious, right? That's it, that's what we're running away. And, and we say, take it get, it, get rid of it, kill it. And then he says, put this on ever had a habit you had to get rid of, you know you need to fill it with something else. What's the void that's being filled? And that's where we fill it with Christ. And he goes through and he gives us this, this list of, of the things that ultimately, that's my Bible. <laughs> this list that we ultimately have to kind of recognize and, and, and see here. He starts off with beloved ones, or chosen ones rather. Holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, Kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, 
bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. And we look at this list and we recognize and see ultimately that our actions are in there. That's what we're called to do. How in the world do we do this? How do we do this? And, and he, he goes on, and so we have this list of these wonderful things, and we love to look at the list and say, yes, I want to do all those things, but man, that's hard. Because if you only knew these people at this church, bunch of hypocrites that they are, right? Just like me. And Paul goes on, and then he, he does what we would refer to as kind of factors it in. He says, above all this, love. Oh, man. Above this list of things, how, what do I put? I put on love. I'm going to fill my life with love. And he's going to give us three things that we look at. The first one being love. What's interesting with love in a Christian world, because we just talked about God's wrath, and, and I said I love to talk about God's love. We get to talk about God's love because we experience the love of Christ. What's interesting when we look at that is, is love is this weird construct Right? If, if I say, just define for me love, you would have a hard time. Most people have a hard time with that because it's this obscure emotional thing. We could turn on the television and look for... I, I, the guy's no longer popular. His name was Fabio, right? The women all know, right? All the, especially you gals over 40, you know who Fabio is. You younger gals, like, I don't even know who this guy's talking about. But Fabio was this, like, the guy, right? He was on the romance novels. And so don't tell me if you were reading them romance novels, because we're going to have to talk if you're reading those. But he also was the I can't believe it's not butter guy, right? I can't believe it's not butter. And so, and he had this beautiful hair, this chiseled body, and I swear he looked just like me. <laughs> and now he looks just like me. I think his hair's falling out. He's got a belly. Me and Fabio, we're just like that. But we have this notion of what love is because, ah, oh, it's this romance and this, oh, that's, uh. then you get married and you realize, hey, women fart. <laughs> I didn't know that. Nobody warned me. You have daughters, oh, it's the same. They all do it. It's not just mine. She's not broken. And you realize that this love is, 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 is half the time, oh, you ain't garlic. Go sleep on the couch. That's not, this is not this romantic thing that, that the world or that, that Hollywood says, this is love. No. What is love? Well, we see what Jesus calls or, or speaks of when he talks to us of love. In John 15, he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has none than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. It's interesting. We, we will recognize love when we see it. Love here, Christ speaks of, is sacrificial. If we all went to the park today and there was a mom with her child, and, and the child falls down and scrapes his knee, what's the mom do? Generally, oftentimes, we'll run over to the child. Are you okay? Or the child will run to the mom. Ah, got a skinned up knee. And we watch the mom and she'll, she'll get out the, the tissue that mom has because moms always have some weird like contraption stuff. They have all this stuff. And they, oh, they wipe out. And what does the mom do? Mom oh, blows it. My mom never did that. My neighbor's mom did that. My mom never blew on my house. She might have spit on it. That was, but my neighbor's mom, it's okay. And they put the little bubbles on it. And they, okay, go play. Put a Band-Aid on it. Dads don't do that, right? Hey, get up, uh, rub some dirt on it, keep playing. Hey, toughen up. It's a, it's a mean world, isn't it? We don't want to get in the way of them coming to Christ. Pain going to lead you to Jesus. That's, I mean, that's like, but, but we know, we recognize, we see the mom, it's, oh, it's so loving. And we love it. We recognize it. We go and we watch an, an older couple, and they're going on a date. And you watch, and, and for you young cats, you may not know this, but you're supposed to open the door for your spouse or for your day. So you, he, he opens the door, puts his hand on the small of her back to help her in, not too low, not too high. Eases her in, doesn't put his hand on her head because then it looks like he's arresting her. Puts her in, winks at her, tells her how beautiful she is, and she says, shut the door, it's cold. Okay. And we recognize, oh, yes, 
We could see love. It's always oh, this. It's this pouring out, giving of oneself for another. And here Jesus, we look at this and Paul says that ultimately all of these, these traits, and he says above these is love to give ourselves to one another. And he talks of this in the unity of the body. He speaks of this to the church in Colossus. This is what a church is to do, is to love one another. To sacrificially give of one another to each other. What a beautiful picture that as I look at that, how do we do this? Christianity and, and, and following after Christ was never meant to be done alone. You'll never find a spot in the Bible where it says do this on your own. In fact, where there are people that are alone, all they want to do is be with other Christians. We look at Paul, what's he doing? He's thinking of these other Christians while he's in prison. His desire is to, I would prefer to be with them. Why? Because there's unity, there's fellowship. And ultimately there's this love because we're all doing this for Christ. And we help each other to focus on that. We help each other to, to center our lives on that. And he goes on and he speaks of the next piece, which is the peace of Christ. And Christ says it this way in, in John chapter 14, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. As we go forward to, to Romans chapter 5, Paul puts it this way, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What's interesting in this, this statement, when we look at the peace of God, this is the great leveler for us. And, and when, I, when I look at this, there, there, Christianity is a level playing field. It doesn't matter how much money you have, you're saved by grace. It doesn't matter how poor you are, you're saved by grace. It doesn't matter how old you are, you're saved by grace. It doesn't matter what color skin you have. You're saved by grace. That's it. it. It's the great level. We have peace with God. We are justified by God's actions and response to the, the, our sin. He comes and takes upon himself flesh and dies for us. We have this peace with God. And so when we talk about putting on uh, these clothing ourselves, if you will, um, as I think the NIV puts it, with these, these characteristics of a Christian, love is above all of them. And then we look at this with the peace of Christ. And then it goes, he goes further and, and ultimately identifies the word of Christ. And we're to center our focus on that. And, and a little bit of disclosure on how I put a sermon together. I, I start usually Sunday with reading the next week's scripture, and then I, I let it percolate a bit, and then I start putting words down on Monday. And then Tuesday, I really sort of start hammering stuff out. Wednesday, I usually have a general idea of the entire outline. And then by Thursday, I have about two-thirds of it done. And then I stop. And on Friday, I take a day off from doing the scripture, doing the, the sermon. And I let the last part percolate. Um, and the reason for that is because I usually know where we started, and I kind of know where we're going, but I give the, part of it's give the Holy Spirit some time to respond to, okay, is this where we're supposed to go? Because if I need to make a hard turn, I want to know. And then Saturday, I go to this coffee shop up by my house, and I'll sit there because it's, it's a nice place. It's, it's, from a, it's another church's coffee shop, and so I steal their space. I pay them for the coffee, and then I'll sit there for about two or three hours, and I'll write the last portion of it. And then if I've got other stuff I need to do with the sermon, I'll tidy it up. Well, I sat down for this section, and it was focused on this was the last of it. I was gonna, I'd had everything else set, and I, I knew exactly where I was going. And I looked at this, and, and I said, man, this, this is an interesting section. Because we were focused in on the word of Christ. And, and I started with this understanding of I, a lot of people know that I was a therapist for a lot of years. I had private practice and, and I was good at it. I just, to be just brutally honest, I was good. One, because I'm a male. There's not a lot of male therapists. And two, because I could guarantee I, I could get a husband in there and he would love me because we would talk about how terrible his wife was. <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. But, but I, was, I was reasonably good. I had a practice, pretty successful at it. And, and I left the field and, and to go into ministry, and I did so screamingly fast. I couldn't get out of it quick enough. And, and the reason for that, and, and other, I know of other pastors who have gone the opposite direction of me, and that's, that's their conviction um, on their stuff, but this is how God worked with me. There was a point when I was doing this that I realized 
I could help you mitigate the pain in life and the shame and the guilt that the Holy Spirit has put there because you've engaged in actions you shouldn't engage in, and I could make you feel better. I could help you navigate life and not experience as much pain, the degree of pain, and never once mention Christ. I could mention all these things in the world and help you feel better, but never lead you to the words of Christ. Never lead you to the truth. And now, now the way I conducted therapy was I generally, everybody knew, my clients all knew I was a Christian, and I would always offer, do you want me to involve Christ in, our, in your counseling? And a, a good handful said yes, and a good handful said absolutely not. And I remember thinking, what am I doing, God? Helping these people to mitigate against the pain that you've put in their lives, that sin should drive us, and the Holy Spirit is working by causing them to feel guilt, causing them to feel shame. That's what that's there for, to drive you to the cross. And I remember thinking in moments, just knowing, man, there's more to offer. And so as I sat to write this section, I sat there and I, my, I set my phone down and, and it sits there and I kind of have my own little area um, that if somebody's sitting there, it really throws off my whole day. Um, but I'm, so I'm sitting, I got my stuff and I put my phone out. I got my, all this stuff lined up and, and all of it, I'm just typing away and bing, my phone rings. And if you have Facebook Messenger, it'll send you a notification to your phone. And this guy texts me on Facebook Messenger and it's a brother and he's broken. And life is not going well. And I know the backstory of what's going on. And he is broken. He says, I don't know what to do. And I'm writing about the words of Christ. And I know that I'm a therapist. And I know that there are things that I could probably say that would, would mitigate around some of this. And, and that, or I could just tell him what Christ says. So I went to the Psalms. I started sending him Psalms. The brother, he says, Pain isn't going to go away. We're in a fallen world. It hurts. I'm going to walk with you through it. But here's what God says. Didn't make the pain go away. Because some pains you can't just stop. But some pains you can articulate and understand that God has a greater purpose in the midst of it. How powerful the words of Christ are to somebody in need. How powerful it is. I, I look at this and, and I open this with, with recognizing in 1960, Aaron Beck came out with cognitive therapy and, and it, it really is a, a, a format of, of conducting therapy. And it's very well researched, very well validated, but the Christians had it for 2,000 years plus. It's not new to us. Where do I focus my attention? How do I make sense of the chaos that ensues in life if I make a bad decision or when somebody else's bad decision crashes into me? Where do I focus? Do I focus back on Christ? Or do I focus on the things of this world? Because if I focus on the things of this world, I'm not going to be satisfied. But if I focus on Christ, it may not make that situation go away. You may be in the middle of a situation that you created and you can't make it go away. You may be in the middle of a situation that somebody else created and it crashed into you and you can't make it go away. You may have a brand new baby and be like, man, when the parents come to pick this kid up, it ain't going away, it's yours. Focus on Christ. Understand that we have peace with God and, and this is an eternal thing. We do this all together. We, we love one another. We have this peace that we have with God through Jesus Christ for eternity. And God has given us his word in order to help us along this journey and a body of believers to grow and love with. What a beautiful thing. So in three to five years, that's your sentence. Guarantee. You start living this out, focusing your life upon him. Every aspect of it. Decisions you have to make that you think God doesn't want anything to do with this. Well, really, why don't you ask him? Does he have anything to say in the decisions you're going to make? Like, should I purchase this truck? Maybe I should ask God. Should I purchase the Harley? Yes, and then ask God. <laughs> he may say no, right? You can ask for forgiveness. That's, no, that's a terrible way to go. It's terrible. Bad pastor. 
but it's a nice Harley. Come on. What if every decision we make, what if we focus on Christ? Keep our mind on that side of the coin. The other side's going to rear its head. We're going to say, oh, that's there. I know it's there. I'm not talking about being naive, but focusing back on the love we have through Christ, that we've been saved from his wrath, that we can put on all of these things. We get to do this together, sharing in love, sharing in God's peace, spending time in God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, oh, I could go on for days speaking of your love, speaking of you. Oh, how much we love you, Lord. Lord, that we can have peace with you through Jesus Christ. Lord, that you saw fit to reach down from heaven to redeem us. God, that there's nothing we have to do, nothing we can do. But Lord, I pray that as we walk our lives through this fallen world, sometimes it is so easy to look to the right or the left and take our focus off of you. I pray that each of us here today would would stay focused upon you, that in our lives we would seek to live our lives in a manner worthy to this calling that you've given us. And Lord, I pray that you would be with us daily, Lord, that we would submit ourselves to you. Father, as I look at the life of Paul and he lives in prison and writes these letters to these churches and I look at the lives of the Christians around the world who have so much chaos in their lives and yet so much joy. And I realize that it's because they're focused on you. I pray that as your church here in this little tiny town in eastern Washington that we would stay focused upon you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.